Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nivise Sasunyavadi Paschacha De Satarine Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Shri Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna.
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna. Jaya Prabhu Pada, Prabhu Pada, Jaya Prabhu Pada, Jaya Prabhu Pada. Jaya Prabhu Pada, Prabhu Pada, Jaya Prabhu Pada, Jaya Prabhu Pada. Jai Om Vishnu Pad Paramahansa Parvajakacharya Asatara Sutta Sri Simad His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Iskam Bibi Tu Founder Acharya Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai All glories to the assembled devotees All glories to the assembled devotees All glories to the assembled devotees All glories Shri Shri Guru and Gauranga Glories to Srila Prabhupada Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve, Gauravani Pracharni, Nir Visesa Sanyavari Paschaja De Satani. Hare Krishna. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, how many were heard the class this morning that I gave this morning? Anyone? Okay. How many of you clipped your nails after class? Anyone? <laughs> I had people write to me, say they clipped their nails after class, yes. I've, um, Daiva Shakti has been doing this every Sunday, she told me, for the last three weeks. And sh she said we've gone through the preface, and what else is there? What else is called the preface, the foreword, the acknowledgments, and we're on the introduction. So we're, we still haven't got to get into the Leela itself. An introduction, she said she was just starting. Um, I don't know how it's been conducted over the weeks. I, I wasn't here for a few of the Sundays. But um, I'm not a very good reader. I mean, I know how to read. <laughs> but I'll read, and hopefully something will happen. In the meantime, anyone has any questions about Srila Prabhupada that have come up to them, we can do that as well. This is Prabhupada Kata, as far as I know. So I don't think we're limited in any way. But as we're here, Srila Prabhupada Lilamrita. Um, it was 1978, <coughs> I was at that time uh, living in Hawaii and I uh, was involved with the temple. I had been temple president for two years or so and then I was treasurer, temple commander. But in 1978, just months after Prabhupada had left, Satsrup Maharaj came and he spent three days with me. and. Uh, did recordings over those three days, a few, some hours each day. And about a year after that, he sent me the transcription of all those recordings. And it was, that was 1978. And uh, <laughs> fortunately for me, my wife, she kept everything because I, I have, I'm very terrible. I have a delete button. I just delete things. Everything Prabhupada gave me practically, I gave away. It's everything, that's what I do. I just don't like to have things. 
and uh, fortunately, they were kept very safely. I didn't start looking at them for almost 20 years went by. And uh, I was living in the Philadelphia area at that time, had a business, a family, all the things. I was, um, I guess, in 40 years old by then. And that's when I opened up that package that Satsurup Maharaj had sent to me, all the transcriptions. He had some of his disciples transcribing everything that all the different devotees had told him. And they were stored in Gita Nagari, uh, the farm, the farm in Pennsylvania, Gita Nagari farm. And sometime shortly after I received all those transcriptions, the shed, whatever you want to call it, the little place, the shed, it went on fire and everything inside was destroyed. Many memories from many of my god brothers and god sisters, they all just literally went up in flames. So somehow or other, um, fortunately for me, those things that I had spoken to him, because 20 years had already passed, but from those notes, um, that's how I gradually over years I um, wrote that book. And even while I was writing it, I felt, of course, I was. I didn't just feel unqualified. I, was, I knew I was very unqualified to write anything about Srila Prabhupada. I mean, there were experiences I had with him, of course, and um, I just tried to present everything the way I remembered it and without without any additions or alterations, just what I had. And after doing that for some months, and it actually, I could immediately, some of the first things I wrote, and I never started writing a book. I started putting things on the internet at that time. It was called America Online. Any, any Westerners, American, would one of the very first um, social media, you know, internet things, America Online was very slow, and I developed a whole mailing list of almost, it grew as I was writing, and I would just mail them out to people. That's what I did. I wasn't thinking about a book. It was Prabhupada Kata, and what made me start it was I was online, and I saw this group, like your Google groups, don't think it was Google then. I don't even think there was Google then. I don't remember. But anyway, it said Prabhupada Kata. And I thought, I can read all Prabhupada Kata. But when I got on there, basically it was a lot of arguing going on about Prabhupada's, how, how initiation should go on. You know, the writ fix were on there, and this person was on. So many people, different people were on there. So I immediately became discouraged because I had no interest in that, in that platform. But I had four or five letters. And these were letters that I had sent to Kirtanananda Swami and Kaladri. Kaladri was his right-hand man in New Vrindavan. And they always wanted Prabhupada nectar. It's why Kirtanananda had me become Prabhupada's servant because he could have an inside man, you know? And I would write these letters, and I sent them off for the first few months. After that, that stopped as well. But for the first few months, I would write these letters to Kaladri, and I was saying, distribute them to all the temples, please. I understood everyone wanted to hear about Prabhupada, and I had this seat, literally, <laughs> right in front of them. 24 hours a day. And I started putting literally just a few sentences. You know, Prabhupada did this. One of the ones was, was you know, there was always brahmacharis coming into the room. In India, as I said, Prabhupada, he was very, very open. Something he didn't do outside of India. Outside of India, you could not just come to Prabhupada's room and hope to have darshan impossible. But in India, as I mentioned this morning, maybe 40, 50 devotees all over in India, the different temples that were trying to open up. And Prabhupada gave himself. This is actually what we want. Huh? When, if you want Krishna, you, you don't accept anything else, just Krishna. Huh? 
So it was like that. The devotees in India, they had nothing else. Food was difficult. Health was difficult. Keeping clean was difficult. Keeping cool in the summer, warm in the winter. Everything was a difficulty. But they had Prabhupada when he came to India. And from the time I was with him, 1972 on, he spent months, almost half a year in, in India every year sometimes. So that's what the devotees were getting. So I could see that. And I would just write little snippets. One of them was, I mentioned, I'm not here, I think, but, you know, Brahmachari came in and they said, you know, Mahatma Gandhi. They say Mahatma Gandhi, his last words were Ram. And they said, is that true, Prabhupada? He said, I don't know, I wasn't there. <laughs> so I was always seeing Prabhupada was this, he was funny and he was very straightforward and very direct. And he definitely wasn't one for flattering anyone, unless he was Vaishnava, huh? Vaishnava. He would flatter, he didn't flatter his disciples. <laughs> but to others, you would hear him flatter his disciples. Huh? To us, he chastised us. <laughs> but to the others, he would say what wonderful Vaishnavas we were. Huh? First class Vaishnavas left money, left college, the university. I did, I left a scholarship in college to join the Hare Krishnas. So, um, as I was writing, and even these, many of these things appear in the Lilamrita, some of the stories, and other stories that I told him, they appear in those little nectar series. If you were around when these books were coming out, he, many things, of course, he didn't put into the biography. But he would have these little nectar books. And some of the stories, of course, I said they would appear in these nectar books. But as I was writing, and it was months and months I had been writing, and I started to get a taste. I was very dried up in the 80s. <laughs> I was an hour away from the closest temple. I had a wife, three children, and a full-time business. So I was busy doing other things. Yeah, this is what happens. You know, you get married, you have to take care of everything. So some things and that was it. No temple was there. But when I began talking about Prabhupada, I actually started to feel life. <laughs> like my heart started to beat again. I would go to work all day and I would think I'm going to get home. And that's what I would do. I would write a story after I got home. I numbered all the stories that were there with Satsarup Maharaj. And I would come home and pick a story. There was no chronological order, nothing. I would think, oh, this looks like fun. I'll do this story. For me, it was all about, it was about my own internal um, process that was going on. But then I didn't feel very good. I thought, who am I? to write. I mean, Satsarup Maharaj, with the help of so many, wrote volumes of Prabhupada's life. I thought, what am I doing? And then, of course, I was questioning whether I should continue. And I guess praying in my own way. And then one night I had a dream. And uh, I've had dreams about Prabhupada, of course, over the years. And I've also had what seemed very much more than dreams, like a visit from Prabhupada. But anyway, this was like a dream. And I'm from New York City area, so East Coast. And growing up, we used to go um, on little mini vacations in the summertime to the Jersey Shore. You know, the Atlantic Ocean was there. Atlantic City, New Jersey, very famous in the USA, Atlantic City. So in this dream, <laughs> And I've never been there. <laughs> I mean, I've been there, but in this state, I don't know. Somehow or other, I'm in Atlantic City with Srila Prabhupada. And we're sitting in a, in like a um, living room. There's about a dozen of us. Srila Prabhupada is there. Kirtanananda was there. Other devotees from New Vrindavan was there. And I'm sitting there. Our shoes were all outside at the door, and we're taking prasadam. And everyone got up, because Prabhupada got up. And they were all finished. I got in there late, 
It was a dream. So walking was slow. As I got into the room and I'm sitting down and I'm taking prashadam and I see everybody leaving with Prabhupada. And I know, another thing I know, you have to finish your prashadam. Otherwise you don't go anywhere. There are certain rules, you know, in our Krishna consciousness. One of them is taking prashadam. When you're taking prashadam, that's what you do. Someone comes in, even senior, you don't offer obeisances. You're honoring Krishna prashadam. So I saw it in front of me, all this prashadam I had to eat, but everyone was walking out the door. So I'm trying to hurry up and eat. And they're already left. I hurry up and eating, and I get finished. And I go out the door, the living room, and the front door, and I'm having a hard time finding my chapels, my slippers. I can't find them. I finally find them, and I can hear kirtan going on. And they're on the boardwalk. Atlantic City has a boardwalk, nice wooden, wide, wide, I don't know, 100, you know, maybe 20 meters wide, and it runs all along the ocean. Of course, there's all shops on one side and the ocean on the other. Very nice. So I finally get out the door, and I get to the boardwalk, and I see them all. They're like a block ahead of me, and kirtan's going on, and I'm trying to get to them. And again, everything was like so difficult, so slow. But I'm running, and as I'm running, I see Prabhupada right in the middle of the kirtan. I just see Prabhupada standing, walking, and he turned around and looks at me, and he goes, come on. And I woke up just like that. And then I thought, okay, that was a sign. Srila Prabhupada was okay. <laughs> so from that point, I just continued on, tried to stay off of the mental platform. You all know the mental platform, huh? When you think, I'm terrible, I'm useless. What am I doing here? Krishna's tolerating me. Huh? I read Prabhupada today, he was saying to the devotee, that my Guru Maharaj, he liked me. He said, I know that he liked me. He gave me his mercy. He said, his kripa. He said, otherwise, he said, I couldn't do anything. He said, but somehow or other, he liked me very much, he said. And he gave me his mercy. And he said, because of that, I was able to do little something. So this is all our position. That's a very, very safe position in Krishna consciousness is to understand I'm nobody. As Prabhupada said, is dog. When I was in Juhu this last week, you know, walking around this place, that place, so many hallways you have to learn when you first go there. But right in the two towers, there's one section there for Sridhar Maharaj. Those of you who've been to Juhu, you've seen our god brother Sridhar Maharaj, who passed away years ago. And there was different paraphernalia of his was there. And one of them was a cap, a well, baseball cap, you know, regular old cap. And on it, it said, Prabhupada's dog. <laughs> That's us, just Prabhupada's dog. And always to be in that position. He was known, um, Sridhar Maharaj was known as the Jolly Swami, right? Isn't that right? Jolly Swami, I think they called him the, because he was. He was very happy, happy devotee, did so much service. And of course, in Juhu in particular, he helped see everything happen there. He was um, doing very much preaching there. So anyway, I guess at this point, we'll go back to the introduction. Does anyone have any questions you want to ask about Srila Prabhupada or from class this morning? I see my last classes, nobody asks questions, and I get up and everybody has a question. You know, that's, everyone has a personal question they want to ask. So that was it. But okay, then we'll begin in this introduction. And uh, this volume begins in Calcutta, 1896, with the birth of Abai Charan Day. It ends in 1965, so the, um, yes, volume one, this is going to cover very many years, 70 years. The worldwide fame of his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, later known as Srila Prabhupada, was to come after 1965, after he arrived in America. 
Before leaving India, he had written three books. In the next 12 years, he was to write 60. I mentioned that this morning, how when I went to um, Hyderabad in 1972, one of the brahmacharis, he'd been a brahmachari for a few years, maybe three years or so, and he was trying to decide his next move. And he finally went into Srila Prabhupada. It was midnight, and Prabhupada heard him. Again, this was Prabhupada in India. He heard him. He said, come on. Come on. Just like in the dream. <laughs> come on. So he went on, and Prabhupada said, yes. Prabhupada, Brahmachari, want to remain fixed up. It's difficult. There's women everywhere. I'm thinking I'll go to the Himalayas, go to Rishikesh, and then go to the Himalayas. And there I can just sit quietly alone, chant Hare Krishna. Prabhupada said, I spent 12 years in Vrindavan. He said, just wasting my time which of course is not at all what Prabhupada was doing, but this is how he gave instruction to this devotee, saying, don't waste your time. He said, just whoever you meet, you tell them about Krishna. Not go to the Himalayas to chant very peacefully. I think it was 1972. I was with Prabhupada. I remember the letter coming in <laughs> from one Mataji. She was married. Her husband's now sannyas. But at that time, she was married. And in New York, Brooklyn, Brooklyn Temple. This was a temple I was initiated in. I think it was 46 Henry Street, 64 Henry Street, something like that. Anyway, um, she wrote they weren't letting the women in the temple room during japa because they were distracting the brahmacharis. So she's writing, she would write Prabhupada many times. If she experienced something she didn't think was right, she'd write the Prabhupada. And she was, Prabhupada knew her. And he says, we're not allowed, we can't chant in the temple room. The brahmacharis are, find it disturbing. <laughs> Prabhupada wrote back, he said, you're in New York City. New York City, the largest city in the USA at that time. Huh? Millions of people there. He said, they're seeing, you're seeing women every day outside of the temple. He said, and you're agitated seeing women in the temple? He said, go to the Himalayas. He said, if you're agitated seeing the women, then go to the Himalayas. But of course, when the boy said, I'm agitated, I want to go to the Himalayas, <laughs> Prabhupada said, no, no, that's not your business. And that's why I say it's one to understand Prabhupada is not easy, and I'm not saying I understand him, but I've seen him react in different situations. Hmm? And he would say whatever was necessary to encourage everyone. Hmm? Encourage the men, encourage the women, encourage brahmacharis, encourage the grahastas. He had to encourage everyone. It's an impossible task, but he did it. Hmm? That's what he did. This morning I mentioned how, how just because you heard Prabhupada say something didn't mean that was the law for everyone. Eh? Prabhupada's sanction of something didn't mean it was his approval. And I got to see that again and again. He dealt with all of us as individuals. He could give a class in a temple room Everyone in that temple room thought he was speaking directly to them. And of course he was. <laughs> he knew how to reach every person. And that's how he established Krishna consciousness. Huh? In the West and then all over the world. By somehow or other understanding how to deal with everyone. We know he arrived in 1965. Huh? This is the next book will start 1965 when he started he arrived in America. When he arrived there, he said, I studied the people. He said, I studied the American people for a year. 
We know what did he do for the first year? That's what he said he did. He studied the behavior, the attitudes, the psychology, not just blindly going in and pounding everybody on the head, huh? the hammer. <laughs> we see that sometimes. Devotees have hammers in preaching. You want to beat Krishna into you. Prabhupada wasn't like that. He was very cautious, very careful to do what was the best thing. Gargamuni Prabhu, he, he's very active now on social media, YouTube, putting so many wonderful, wonderful quotes he finds. He put one on, he showed Prabhupada one, some of the very first kirtans. Where were they? Tompkins Square Park. He didn't have cartels, didn't have a murdanga, didn't have a harmonium, of course. He had a bongo drum. Just the bongo drum. It, they were easy at that time in the U.S. That was because before there were hippies, there were beatniks. They were hippies before we said hippie, that word hippie. They were like these beatnik people. And of course, they all did intoxication, sing poetry, write songs. They were anti-establishment. So anyway, he had a bongo drum. And his, all he did was keep the beat and chanted. That melody you heard, he chanted that melody for hours. And he would gradually bring it up, and then he would start again. But that bringing it up could be in the course of an hour. But that's all he did, was just chant under that tree. That same tree is still there. You go, there's a plaque, the Hare Krishna movement. Eh? Prabhupada started chanting in this place. The society began there, under a tree not in a building, some marble building, or not even a storefront. It started in a park. All the time I was with Srila Prabhupada, he would always want to sit on the lawn, in the garden, Bhaktivedanta Manor. How many pictures do you see Prabhupada sitting in that garden, uh, the front garden? Nice, beautiful lawn. If the weather was nice, some sunshine, he would much rather be outside under a tree than sitting in even his nicest rooms, which Bhaktivedanta Matter have very beautiful, very wonderful room. Hmm. When he was there, first temple, of course, 26 Second Avenue. And he stayed, the storefront was the temple, huh? matchless gifts. You see the shop, Daiva Shakti runs all the books, book stalls, the shop, Matchless Gifts, it's called that very same place. So that was the name of the store before it became the Radha Krishna Temple storefront. And behind there, almost like you have in India, you would go behind the storefronts and you would go into like a garden area and then there were rooms. So these rooms were rented out. This is 1965, 1966. So Prabhupada's room was behind the storefront. He had to walk from behind the storefront through this little garden area on the ground floor area. Then he went up to his room. And in his room, of course, he had his trunk with his Shrima Bhagavatam. Those first canto, three volumes were there. And all his notes for Bhagavad Gita were there, which had to be put into a book. So it was two years later, well not two years later, it was um, 1973. Now I had been Prabhupada's servant for almost a year. And he was having um, GBC meetings. At that time, the 12 GBC members, the original GBC. And Prabhupada had, they would meet, his idea of GBC meetings, they would meet for one, two hours, and they did that for three days. And everything was about preaching, how to preach, innovations in preaching. Prabhupada, they would discuss, this is going on here, this is like that. So it was all about preaching, these GBC meetings, and how to carry it on. 
And these, of course, only people there were Srila Prabhupada in this room. This was in the Lotus Building. And the GBC members. And I would go in there. I, we always distributed sweets. Prabhupada always gave prasadam. Anyone comes into your, his room, you get prasadam. It's another one of the principles. Without fail, everyone has to get prasadam. Most important. Another phrase Prabhupada used, most important, never meant anything else was less important. He emphasized importance by saying most important. Unfortunately, men of, many of us, especially in English, we would think that that meant everything else was less important. But that was not Prabhupada's understanding, like he would say to us, all the services, most important. Whether you're sweeping the floor, you're dressing the deity, you're distributing books, he would say, most important service. Hmm? So you begin to understand a little. You have to be around him <laughs> to get this understanding of what it means. When he sees something going on and he doesn't criticize it, chastise you, doesn't necessarily mean it was okay. It means he's tired of asking for change, to do things the way he wants it done. No sense, we say, you know, we say beating a dead horse. No sense asking over and over and over if it's not going to happen. I learned this from Prabhupada. You say your piece and then you have to be, you have to let it go. You know, like mailing the letter, Prabhupada would all use that, right? Just the postman. Just deliver the letter. But once you delivered it, you're done. You don't come back again and again and say, no, 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 you're not doing this, you're not doing this, you're still doing this. He didn't do that. He didn't discourage anyone in that way. So we would just think, this is what's going on. Anyway, they're chanting Hare Krishna. When they had the installation here, 1975, one of his godbrothers, Prabhupada, they're doing, you know, Maharaj, not calling him Maharaj, they're doing wrong. They're do doing it wrong. They're doing it wrong. He said, it's okay, they're just practicing. Hmm? This was Prabhupada. Always encouraging and always defending his disciples. They're not doing it wrong, they're practicing. Hmm? <laughs> so 26 Second Avenue. So this GBC meeting's going on. And one of my god brothers was a tall, thin, tall. <laughs> they had a nickname for him. He was an, another. Many of Prabhupada's disciples, we can say they're characters. <laughs> Many of them. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. It's required. They have personality, these people. This was a character. And he came up to me, said, what's going on at these GBC meetings? I said, oh, I don't stay in there. I was, <laughs> I was never, never into management. Not that I couldn't manage, but it's, to me it was just too difficult. Too much disagreement, too much fighting, all these things I, did, I didn't like to do. But I say, uh, I don't, you know, I don't know. He said, I don't trust them. <laughs> so that goes back way, way back to the beginning huh, with the GBC. <laughs> he doesn't trust them. And I said, well, he said, how can I go in? I said, well, you can't. You're not a GBC. I want to go in. I said, well, I distribute sweets. I said, I can give you the plate of sweets. You can distribute the sweets. And then maybe you can just sit down, you know. Okay, okay. Of course, now I'm curious as well. So I go in with them. You know, that's it. As soon as someone arouses your curiosity, something you didn't even think about, all of a sudden it becomes, yeah, yeah, I go. I want to know what's going on too. What are they up to in there? You know, what are these discussions? So we go in. He's got the sweets. And so while that's going on, there's really nothing going on. There are two devotees talking. One's sannyasi. He's already sannyasi both from Hawaii. The other one, Grahasti, opened up Hawaii with his wife. And 
um, just to give background, Hawaii is a little island in the middle of Pacific. And of course, there's the local culture, Hawaiian culture, like Samoan culture, very big Pacific Islanders, big people. But their culture, they're very, um, they speak very frankly and sometimes even with vulgarities, you know, to make emphasis, emphasize the point. So they're right in front of Prabhupada, they're having this conversation, but the conversation they're having is an argument. And it's loud enough that other people can hear it. And this is just like a break time within the GBC meetings. And even it got, you know, yeah, you're hell, this is this, you know, and this is <laughs> just saying different things. So while this is going on, and Prabhupada, he's just sitting. You know, he knows his disciples. He knows who he's making disciples from. You know? And Prabhupada's just sitting there, but he sees the devotee. The devotee's name was Bhaktajana. His karmi name was John, Bhakti John. They used to call him Bhakti John, and he came, became Bhakti Jana. <laughs> so he sees him. Other thing I learned from Prabhupada, you don't do this, you do this. <laughs> so he comes over to Prabhupada. So now these boys are arguing. This is just going on, They're having a little conversation, Hawaiian style. And Prabhupada calls the boy over, and he's right next to Prabhupada. Prabhupada looks at him. He said, you were there in the beginning, right? Yes, Prabhupada. He was there in New York for the very beginning. He said, you were there. He said, 26th Second Avenue. And Prabhupada knew he was there. He didn't forget anything. <laughs> But he's having this conversation with him as this other conversation's going on. And of course, the devotees in the room, they're wondering, what's Prabhupada talking about now? See, everyone's always wondering, what's going on? Right? There's a song I remember in America, what's going on? <laughs> we all want to know what's going on. So Prabhupada's just talking to him very intimately. So you remember. 26 second, yes, bro, but yes, it was there. He said, you know, I had the place behind the storefront. That was my room. Yes, bro, but he said, do you know what the rent was in that room? He said, $62. 26, 62. Prabhupada started going. He's talking, he's going, 26. 62. There's 26 backwards with 60. And Prabhupada's laughing. And the devotee's laughing. We're laughing. And everyone's wondering, what are they talking about? And Prabhupada's just making this 26, 62. 26, 62. <laughs> Prabhupada thought that was very interesting and funny. But he just called them over just to have a little conversation while all these other things were going on. But we wonder, what's Prabhupada talking about? When I was with Prabhupada, every time I came out of his room, you know, there were different places in different temples. In New Dwarka, Los Angeles, I would have to go down to the bottom of the stairs. No one would go up to the stairs. We went up the stairs, there were three doors, Prabhupada's sitting room, Prabhupada's bedroom, Prabhupada's main sitting room. And over at the end was servants' quarters. So these doors... So no one ever went up those stairs. That was Prabhupada's quarters. But if I went down, I would have to go down. For lunch, I'd have to go down and get ingredients sometimes. Or anyway, do different things. As soon as I got to the bottom, there was always somebody there. Ladies, men, boys, girls. They were all, that time we say men, but we were all children, young. As soon as I get down, what Prabhupada say? Here at Krishna Balaram Mandir. Just outside his sitting room. You see that room now. It has all the different paraphernalia Prabhupada's. That was the servant quarters when I was there. That's where I took rest. 
Right there, there's a straw mat in the exact spot. That's, that's where I slept. That's where I got malaria three times, lying there on the floor. That's what it was like to be with Prabhupada, hmm, traveling around. And to this day, that's what it's like to be in Vrindavan. He said that boy said Vrindavan doesn't judge. It may not judge, but it certainly tests you every day. Every day you get tested, it seems, in Vrindavan, yes? Yeah. Provinda Mataji said, everywhere, by Kunta, everything's very nice. Vrindavan, it's always chaos. Huh? When Krishna was here, it was always chaos. One demon after another, after another. Rain falls, walking into snakes, everything, nothing but difficulties. That's Vrindavan, that's the Vrindavan Leela. And we die for this Leela, to live in that Leela. That's what Prabhupada gave us. So everywhere, it, when Prabhupada was here, all we wanted to know, what's Prabhupada doing? What did Srila Prabhupada say? And I would have those little snippets. So that's how the book started. Not at all a book, just writing to devotees. And they would send me little messages. I became more and more inspired through my god brothers and my god sisters. Anyway, um, we have about 10 minutes left. I haven't read anything from the introduction. I did read two sentences. Does anyone have any questions? No one has any questions here. <laughs> Must be the heat. Hmm? Yes, Govinda. Mataji. Then give it up. <laughs> well, I mean, um, you know, he always told us to get up early, and you know, <laughs> there were the four regulative principles and the the routine. He never stopped telling us to do that. But other things, you know, in the beginning, it was very well known: no harmonium during kirtan, no harmonium. He said it repeatedly. But then again, he stopped saying it. And the harmonium came more and more. Now people, some of them, they don't even know how to have a kirtan if they can't play the harmonium at the same time. At one very well-known kirtaniya, and this was in Ukraine, huh? they would have the kirtan. And they just started chanting Hare Krishna. I said, you've got to offer pranams to Srila Prabhupada. You've got to chant. You know? Namah Om Vishnu Padaya. You've got to chant Sri Krishna Chaitanya. He said, I can't play that on the harmonium. <laughs> I said, what does that have to do with it? This is how we begin everything with Srila Prabhupada. It's how we start our day, the moment from the moment you get up until you take rest at night. This is the process. So it didn't apply to everything, but it definitely applied to many specific things. Again, with myself, if I was doing something, I always say about massage, when I started massaging on my own schedule. Up to that point, every before I move my hands, he would, okay, you can go to the next spot. You can go to the next spot. But then I thought, I've been doing this for a year. I know how long to do it. And I just started moving. He didn't say anything for three days. <laughs> the third day, as soon as I took my hands off his head, he said, you massage until I tell you to stop not until you tell you to stop. Then I realized how, to the degree of service, what it meant to Prabhupada. You didn't do anything without his permission. You knew what the setup was. Anything outside of that, if you did it, you could be chastised for it. If you slept in in the morning, he would call. Why are you sleeping? Not just me, ever all the time, wherever we went around the world. If there wasn't a temple there, immediately the devotees would think, oh, I can just, <laughs> no temple. You know, we were dependent on temples for our program. But Prabhupada said, what's the program? Even we were in a house by the beach, morning program had to be there. Traveling in the car from Calcutta to Mayapur, we stopped at the mango grove for Mongol Arctic. Yeah, prayers to the spiritual master. We did, we chanted, and then we took prasadam. 
So Prabhupada maintained that program, he called it the routine. Routine means automatic. Get up, cold bath. <laughs> I say, he said, cold bath, he said, is not an austerity. He said, it's common sense, Ayurvedic principle. You get up in the morning, you take cold bath. He said, it's not an austerity. Here, it's not even possible in the summertime to take a cold, a cold shower. <laughs> There's no such thing as cold water. We get plenty in the winter, but not in the summer. So that's another austerity. Huh? But it's not an austerity. Our life, we're so, we're so blessed to be in Vrindavan. Like I said, it took me many, many years to realize that I should be here in Vrindavan. Many, many 50 <laughs> before I was ready to settle in and now I just beg please don't kick me out of here because I see staying here is I have God brothers God sisters will never come back to India I think how sad how unfortunate even at this age yeah, just trying to be comfortable there's no comfort especially when you're 70 years old it doesn't even exist you're happy <laughs> as as everyone in India knows very well, and we learn from Prabhupada, happiness is passing stool. Hmm? You all know that story? Gopal Ban? Prabhupada would tell these stories. Prabhupada would tell stories that were funny. He considered them funny, and we would sit there. We didn't quite get Indian humor. You know, we didn't understand. It had a special flavor. And very often it involved or bodily, bodily activities. Anyway, we have a few minutes. I'll just tell Gopal Ban. Well, he was like the court jester for the king. You know, had that service. Sometimes I think I'm like that for Panchagoda. You know, like the <laughs> try to amuse him sometimes. Slip in a little, little instruction in between. <laughs> so the king's daughter got married. So, of course, he called in Gopal Ban, the king, and he says, what did you think of this wedding reception you can imagine? Right? The king, you know, now that you have, what, three days, so many days, wedding goes on and on and on. And Gopal Ban said, I feel very, very happy after passing stool. And the king looked at him. He just, his daughter just got married. He looked at him. He was ready to have him killed right on the spot. He said, hey, what are you saying? He said, uh, understand. He said, try to understand. He said, what is there to understand? He said, I'll explain. Give me time. So, yeah, I said, I, he, he wanted, Gopal Pan said to the king, I want to show you this place. We have to go on the river. So the king got his entourage. They all get on the boat. His he didn't tell him, Gopal Ban didn't tell him, it was a long ride. So they're in the river for some time, a half hour goes by, hour goes by. The king says, where is this place? It's all, we're almost there, we're almost there. He said, I have to pass. We're almost there. So finally the king said, stop the boat. He said, I have to pass. I have to pass stool. Gopal Ban pulled the boat over, the king went. His entourage went there and the, behind the bushes, the trees, passed. Gopal Ban sitting on the boat. The king comes back with his entourage onto the boat. Gopal Ban says to the king, he said, how do you feel now? He said, I'm very happy after passing stool. <laughs> Gopal Ban said, see? And we're just sitting there. <laughs> well, Prabhupada would laugh and laugh and laugh, you know. So that was to be with Prabhupada. You had to learn, you had to understand. You know, we spent time trying to understand different things, the way he said things, the way he did things, how he dealt with us, his children. There's other Gopal Ban stories, equally as funny. <laughs> Any other questions? So the three, it wasn't, but I've seen in my own time with Prabhupada, many things he would say to me three times. After a while, I learned to just 
after once just comply with his desire because that's also important. Guru gives you an instruction, there's no question of why and there's no question of saying no. Even if he's trying to give you something, refusing, that's also an offense. The only thing you can do when the guru speaks is yes. And as he would say, it's not a question of why. Do this. Don't ask why. There's no why, he would say. This is the instruction. Karbajan Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Prabhu, as you said, Prabhupada used to chastise. And after chastising, uh, would he throw the devotee out? After what? Would he throw the devotee out of the movement? For doing what? Throw the devotee out of the movement. Throw him out after what did the devotee do? No, if he chastised the devotee, he throw them out from the temple. No, Prabhupada, <laughs> the only thing Prabhupada ever corrected was, again, philosophy. If someone was speaking some Sahajiya philosophy, Gopi Bhava Club philosophy. In Hyderabad, I mentioned this morning, then we went to Ahmedabad, 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 another program for a week. And while Prabhupada was there, one of his disciples, Devananda, he was also sannyasi, Devananda Maharaj. He was one of Prabhupada's first servants. He served Prabhupada personally. But he had left. He came to India. Sometimes people come to India and they, they hear so many things. Something's more attractive. Somebody's going to give them something, you know, tap them on the head and tell you who you are. So many different things. So these dangers were there. Prabhupada always tried to protect us. But he also left. Now, this was 1972, the end of 1972. I don't know. He was probably gone for over a year or more. And, he, and everybody that came to see Prabhupada after, oh, he had long hair and a beard. And this was our disease. Long hair. So he's matted, long hair, beard. And he's wearing some, well, bright orange clothing. We didn't, that also, we wore saffron. You know, there was a specific color that is known as saffron. And if you look at the inside of a conch shell, you'll see saffron. That's the color that we tried to reproduce back in the early days. Now there's so many varieties of shades of color, you can see. So many colors are there, all considered passable. Did Prabhupada approve of that? Again, what's he going to do? Spend all his time chastising or is he going to preach about Krishna? What's, this is his choices he had. So Devananda comes in and he's all matted hair, beard, wearing this unusual looking clothing <laughs> for us. Brahmananda's there, he's the secretary. So Prabhupada Devananda is here, he came to see you. Prabhupada immediately let him in. He knows he's gone. He's left Iskan, left Krishna consciousness, practicing who knows what, maybe Shiva. I don't know what he was following. But he comes in and sits before Prabhupada, and Prabhupada tries to have a conversation with him. How are you doing? And, and he just starts doing all these mudras and things in front of Prabhupada. You know, with his... I'd never seen these things up before. Now I see them all the time. You know, you go into the Pujari room, you can see lots of little fishes. and We didn't know any of these things. But now he knew them because he had found better, better guru. This is what people were thinking. So crazy. He started doing this. And Prabhupada tried to speak with him, but he didn't. He just, and Prabhupada just, <laughs> I always say, like Lord Narsingadev, like the pillar crack, Lord Narsingadev comes out. 
Prabhupada, he would start, his lips would quiver, eyes would become inflamed, shaking. And he just turned to Brahmananda, he said, get him out of here. First he said to him, that was after, he looked at him, he said, if you want to come back, he said, you can come back. He said, you dress like him. He pointed to Brahmananda, sannyasi. He was ready to bring him right back in. You be son, you were a sannyasi, we'll just, you go out and preach. You take up your sannyasi again, everything is forgiven. He said, you come back, he said, you look like him. You dress like him. And he just continued doing this. And then Prabhupada just started shaking. He said, Brahmananda, he said, take him out of here. And when you said that to Brahmananda, you know, to take him out, Pra Brahmana is an expression, take somebody out means much more than just allowing, take him out, you, you Brahmana, you know, Brahmana would. So that was, so that was there. Pra Prabhupada was always ready. And I always say that, loyalty. Prabhupada, loyalty was eternal, but you can give it up in a second if you like. And that's the great misfortune, you know, someone prepared to do that, thinking there's something better out there. That's offenses, huh? That's why, especially here in Vrindavan, you have to be very, very careful. Very careful to follow Prabhupada's program in every way so that you're protected. Then you're protected, Prabhupada said. No question Maya can enter. 16 rounds, regulative principles, read the books, engage in service. He said, Maya can't touch you. And it's a fact because you have the blessings. You have Prabhupada's presence. That's what he says. I'm personally present in my instructions. You want to be with Prabhupada? That's what they say. You were with Prabhupada personally. How it's so hard. I haven't been Prabhupada since 77. What was it? 40, 45 years ago. Hmm? And I feel closer now than sometimes when I was massaging his body. So what does personal presence mean? It means you follow very strictly everything. And every, each little thing you think doesn't matter, they all matter. And they're all preventing you from making progress. Preventing me <laughs> from making progress. Each little thing you think doesn't matter, matters. All right. And it also matters to end on time here. So thank you all very much for being here. And Srila uh, Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hare Krishna.